this lecture, we're going to discuss antibody and antigen uh, recognition. And this is an extension of the plasma membrane discussion. And it's also going to be very applicable in the immune system discussions. So we're back to the question of binding uh, specificity in relationship to these proteins, either in the form of viruses, bacteria, uh, various kinds of signaling molecules. These extracellular signals, uh, the molecule, the particular shape of that molecule binds to a cell membrane uh, receptor. And once that binding occurs, there are various responses uh, that happen to the cell as a result of the binding. So ligand binding is a molecule that's bound reversibly by a protein uh, in relationship to the ligand binding to this protein receptor. And the protein receptor is called the binding site. And the ligand, the antigen, which is a term that we'll use again in immunology, is considered to be a type of ligand. So the binding site, that protein receptor, is complementary in shape to the ligand. And many of these receptors are very specific and they only bind to certain ligands. And the way in which these ligands are attracted to the receptor and the way in which they bind to the receptor has to do with the size of the molecule, the shape of the molecule, the charge of the molecule, and whether or not the molecule is hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Now, hydrophobic means uh, uh, non-water soluble or water hating. I guess you could call it. Uh, hydrophilic is another way of saying uh, water liking or water loving. And so hydrophilic uh, or hydrophobic actually is a molecule that repels water and hydrophilic is a molecule that essentially can dissolve in water or certainly easily transport in water. So ligand binding uh, refers to the interaction between the particular ligand and the binding site. Again, it's very specific. And the binding site really can discriminate against the thousands. So if you can imagine a cell lives in a protein-based media, and that particular binding site will only bind to either one or a very select few uh, molecules. And, and these binding sites are flexible and they can actually change the shape. And so often what happens is you can have a binding of a protein and a ligand that's actually accompanied by a change in the protein that can actually make the binding site uh, more complementary. And that uh, phenomena is called an induced uh, fit. So here is an example of what that induced fit is all about. So this, we can, we can see this as a particular uh, protein binding site. And we have our ligand. And once the uh, ligand lands on the binding site, this other part uh, of the molecule actually fits over the site and uh, makes the fit uh, induced. And when that process happens, uh, the fit becomes much tighter and it's much more complementary. Uh, here's another situation where we can have a binding site here on the other side of the molecule. And the same thing happens where we get the ligand binding and then we get an induced fit uh, where the actual fit between uh, the, the binding site and the ligand becomes uh, tighter. So antibodies are structured a lot like that where these antibodies are actually designed to recognize and signal and bind to characteristic shapes and patterns 
that are found on uh, on viruses and bacteria. And so this uh, gold region here is what's called a variable region. So that's the region that actually changes in, in shape to become complementary to that antigen that uh, actually, you know, entered the body and is causing inflammation and is considered to be a pathogen by the body. So we get these antibodies uh, created that are complementary in shape uh, to the antigen. So here's a picture of that. So you can see these antigens are very characteristic in shape and uh, the uh, antibodies are then developed or, or changed, uh, so to speak, to actually uh, fit the complementary shape of the antigen. So here we have this circular shape, of course, will fit here, and uh, these various other types of antigens will fit in a very complementary way to their respective uh, antibodies. And this process, obviously, is very important in relationship to the immune system functioning and reaction to uh, infection. So here is a more specific picture of the antigen-antibody reaction. And here, these antibodies are triggered when a B cell encounters its matching uh, antigen. And so up here, we can see that the antigen is a star-like structure, right? And it lands on its respective uh, antibody that's designed to uh, fit that antigen. And uh, the antigen is engulfed right inside of that B cell. And the antigen is digested. And then the interesting thing about the B cell is it then displays the antigen fragments on its own membrane. So the actual, uh, if we can consider the star-like uh, antigen structure is digested by the, bees, by the B cell. And then the actual parts of that uh, antigen are actually displayed, and we'll learn about this more in, um, in the immunology lectures, but that the fragments of the antigen are actually displayed on the membrane and this attracts other molecules and even attracts other T cells uh, to the region. And then because the uh, antigen is very specifically identified now, then other cells can react and basically eradicate uh, the antigen. So this other process, and we're gonna learn about this certainly uh, in the immune system lectures, but you can say that this process is very complicated, but it's very closely related to the shape of these antigens, that the immune system is, is really aligned, is really functioning around how complementary uh, shapes are created to fit these very unique antigens. And that's very important for uh, the myriad of bacterial infections, for instance. So in our digestive tracts, uh, we have very many bacteria that live in our digestive tract that the immune system doesn't recognize as being foreign, that those bacteria are fine. It's okay to have them live in the digestive tract. But say, for instance, this E. coli comes along and then all of a sudden that E. coli is not welcome in the environment. And sometimes it's something as subtle as just a change in the shape of the outside of that bacteria. So it's, it's, it can be very subtle. So once these antibodies have been released, and again, they're very specific to the shape of that particular antigen, once they're released into the bloodstream, then they can float around in the bloodstream and attach themselves to these antigens. And uh, I, I, in the beginning, we talked about the agglutination process that happens when we get a whole clustering of these antibodies and antigens 
that hook up together. And then they can also be eliminated ultimately by the liver or by the spleen or by, by various other organs. So our first example uh, asks us the question, uh, if we performed an ELISA test and detected antibodies to HIV, what does that positive uh, ELISA test mean? Well, first of all, what the ELISA test uh, did was it detected antibodies to HIV. Okay, so does that mean that HIV exists? Well, possibly. Uh, the answer is probably that if we did detect antibodies to HIV, what that means is that somewhere along the line, the body was exposed to the HIV virus and there was a production of antibodies to that virus. Now the time period here is unknown. We don't know how or, or when that happened. But the fact that we have the antibodies present means that at some time in the past, the patient or patients were exposed to HIV. Now, often when you have a positive ELISA test, that means that you have to do further confirmation of the presence of the virus. So generally, 99% of the time, having antibodies means that you've been exposed uh, to that pathogen. So the second example is if we detected presence of the virus but no antibodies, what does that mean? So we have, we detect virus, so we did a particular type of test that actually identified presence of that virus. Uh, but we didn't detect any antibodies, so there were no antibodies. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, what that means is it can mean several things. Uh, it can mean that uh, there was an exposure uh, to the virus very recently, but there hasn't been enough time for the antibodies to develop. And that certainly is a possibility. Uh, the other possibility is that the immune system of our patient is so suppressed that there isn't any antibodies at all anywhere. So for instance, um, some individuals uh, who don't have a reaction to a vaccine uh, often means that they just don't have, their immune system is so suppressed that there isn't even any recognition and there isn't any uh, multiplication or development of antibodies because the immune system is so suppressed. So the third example is if we determined our patient did not have antibodies for the virus in question, how would administering antibodies uh, work? So Often this is a condition or this is a situation that happens, for instance, if uh, a child or a person uh, steps on a rusty nail, for instance, and it's suspected that possibly the individual might be exposed uh, to tetanus, to the tetanus bacteria. And um, so uh, that possible tetanus exposure is such that um, antibodies are given right away and they're often given in the form of a gamma globulin shot and what that does is uh, it actually provides antibodies to tetanus immediately so basically you get antibodies to tetanus uh, you know when you go in to be seen about you know, stepping on a rusty nail, for instance. And what that does is it gets the body started in terms of eradicating the bacteria. And then once 
the individual is able to develop their own antibodies, then their own antibodies will be will will take over. But this is a way that you can actually kind of uh, prophylactically, so to speak, treat somebody if you have a strong suspicion they were exposed because we don't really want to wait around and see whether or not indeed our patient is exposed to something as extreme as tetanus. We'd rather just give them antibodies right away. So that's the reason why in some cases uh, another disease where that happens is rabies, that uh, if you're suspected of being exposed to rabies, you will be given rabies uh, gamma globulin uh, right away. So that concludes our discussion about antigens and antibodies. Thank you very much for visiting educator.com.